Good evening, gang. I am Joe Edelman, and welcome to The Last Frame Live, the longest running weekly photography live stream on YouTube. If you're watching live, you probably already know the drill. Please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you are watching from already. God, we got a lot of people here. We got Lynn sneaking in here from New York at the last minute. Ron, all the way from Thursday in Australia. Uh, let's see, I got Greg here in Northern California, Jay in Southern California, Cooley in Hobart, Indiana. Uh, who else do we got here? We got FN89 from Whidbey Island, Tommy in Ohio, Robert in Albuquerque. Uh, who else? Let's see, did I miss anybody? I think I missed a couple people. TC from the Gulf Coast, uh, Lawrence J all the way from Philippines. This really is a worldwide effort. Thank you. And look, if you're watching the replay, no worries, drop a comment below the video so that I know you were here. You're an important part of this community. Okay, so uh, photo news. Not a lot of stuff going on, but I did want to share with you, I'm, I'm going to own it, okay? I have been having an urge for a while to pick up a lens that is like a 1.8 or a 1.4. So you know that I work pretty much with straight across the board f2.8 lenses in my trinity of zoom lenses, right? Uh, all Tamron, which I love, absolutely love. I love the fact that all three of them, same size filter, six year warranty, can't beat it. So um, I've been going back and forth in my head and, and this is literally, I don't wanna call it gas because I'm not buying the latest and the greatest. But um, I am going to share this with you, one, to own it, to be completely honest and transparent, but two, also because it's on a crazy sale right now. And no, I don't make any money, but I figured I would share this because that's what kind of tipped the scales for me. Uh, I've just been having an urge to mix things up. You folks that have followed me for a long time, you've heard me talk a lot about my career and how I've gone through different stages, starting as a newspaper photographer and so on. And, you know, I'm right about at the 10-year mark of teaching. Uh, and I love what I'm doing. Don't worry. I'm not going to stop teaching anytime soon. But uh, in terms of what I shoot, I am at a point where I want to branch out a little bit. I want to experiment and play around. Uh, I'm feeling like it's time for me to start tweaking my style and, you know, maybe even explore some other things. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing fashion portraits. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop photographing people. No. But, but this is kind of how my career has evolved over the years. And especially um, given that I'm educating and I spend so much time talking to photographers about all genres of photography, uh, I'm really kind of feeling a little bit of self-pressure that I, I need to branch out a little bit. Anyway, all that said, I've been going back and forth in my head for a while now about picking up. Uh, either like a 55 or an 85 or a 105 or a 135 uh, faster prime lens. And so, of course, part of the, the question is, you know, I don't need it. I want it. And I want it to be a lens that I'm really going to be able to, to put to use. So I've been going back and forth for a little while and have really been kind of settling on not the 50, um, because 50 millimeters of focal length that I just, I hardly ever gravitate to. Um, so that would be great if I was going to go pick up street photography or something, which I'm probably not. Uh, so it was more a matter of, you know what, I want to go with uh, more of a portrait lens, but, but a longer portrait lens, not the standard 85. Uh, so I'm bouncing around between the 105 and like a 135. And you guys know how I feel about Sony lenses. I, I won't spend for Sony glass. I own the one Sony lens, the, the 200 to 600 that I use for sports, my grandkids, right? But that's it. So um, one of the lenses that I did look at a little while ago and, and did some video comparisons on YouTube and talk to a few people, one of which uh, that I know personally who owns it, uh, and that was the Samyang 135 f1.8. It is an autofocus lens because that's important to me. I, my eyes are at a point where manual focus would be 
very slow for me. And certainly if I was photographing any kind of movement, forget it. So um, it's basically, you know, it's a $1,000 lens, right? In fact, here I can just to share this. So this is a lens we're talking about here. So this is for Sony cameras, right? Um, so it's on sale right now, $300 off. So this is a $1,000 lens for $699. Um, I did not purchase the Samyang brand. I purchased the Rokinon brand. So let me just explain that, right? This is the exact same lens. It's just that one says Samyang, one says Rokinon. They look exactly the same. They work exactly the same. There's no difference. Samyang is the actual manufacturer. Uh, I decided to go with the Rokinon just because Rokinon does have a presence in the United States corporately. And um, it's a brand that actually goes way back with the Sony cameras when a lot of the tech was Minolta. Rokinon used to be uh, a lens brand that was used with Minolta now. So I thought, you know what? I'll go with, with the Rokinon version. Same price, same thing. Uh, they both had the same warranties, all that stuff. So, you know, even if you go with a Samyang, um, because the, the Rokinon one was a little hard to find, even if you go with a Samyang, you're in great shape. But everything I've read about the lens is great. Um, the good part of it is, is most retailers today, even brick and mortar retailers have a very generous return policy. So I've decided I'm going to try it out. Uh, I do have a couple things that I want to be able to shoot with it specifically. Uh, so that's key. While it's kind of a gas purchase, like I don't need it. Uh, I want to be very clear. I do have a few projects that I'm working on where I will be able to put this lens to good use. So my point being I've got a business idea, concept behind it so that it, it's going to pay for itself, right, in that regard. So it's not just for, for fun. But uh, I wanted to share that with you, again, mainly just because of um, the price, the, the sale at $300 off. It's a heck of a sale. Uh, I will share the Amazon link for you there in the chat. I'll put it in the uh, description underneath the video later. Uh, but for any that are Sony users, uh, if you do your research, and look, don't take my word for it. I, I have yet to actually touch the lens, right? All the research online, all of it about this lens is extremely positive. Really the biggest knock on the lens, if you want to use it as a short prime for sports, you're not going to get the full capacity of the burst capabilities of most of the Sony cameras because it only has one autofocus motor in it. But for portrait work, photographing models and that kind of stuff, more than fast enough, more than adequate. And in quite a few of the tests, it actually beats the G Master lens in sharpness. Contrast matches almost spot on. So for the money, bingo, right? So anyway, that's that piece. I wanted to share that with you uh, right out of the box. So by all means, you can go ahead and you can give me grief. But at least uh, my justification is it, it's a gas purchase that I'm, I'm going to be able to actually put to good use and uh, use it for some real projects that I have coming up. All right, let's dive into our next thing, which is our quote of the week. All right, this week, I have got a quote for you from a photographer that I'm going to be very honest. I was not super familiar with this person's work until I started doing the daily photo quotes. Um, and when I came across this particular quote, this is the quote that first introduced me to this photographer and to this photographer's work. And I'm, I'm actually going to share two different photographers with you uh, as a result of this tonight. But the quote is by a photographer named William Eggleston. I don't really look at other people's photographs at all. It takes enough time to look at my own. When I stumbled upon this quote, my first thought was, hell yeah. Like, there, there is a commonly bad piece of advice that is given to new photographers today. And I want you to listen close because when I say it's bad advice, it's well-intended by everyone who gives it. 
but it's oftentimes given without an important piece of context. And that's what makes it bad. And that piece of advice is that if you're starting out in photography, I don't care if you're young, I don't care if you're old, but if you're new to photography, one of the things that you should do to advance your photography is study the work of other photographers. That's the bad piece of advice because of the way it was given. The good version of that is you should study the work of well-documented photographers. By default, that means the iconic photographers, right? The Ansel Adams of the world, the Westons of the world, the Yusuf Karsh, uh, all of those people, Stieglitz, all of them, and the list goes on and on and on, right? There are hundreds of them. Why them when they're not contemporary? Why them when indeed the, the photography that you probably love and fawn over is photography that you're seeing on Instagram right now that's being done by photographers who have a style that you would like to replicate or do yourselves? So why would you study these masters? Well, here's why. And it's not to say that you shouldn't fawn over those photographers on Instagram and shouldn't look at their work, but here's the problem. You can find tons of information about Ansel Adams. You can find loads of interviews, articles that he's written, books that he's published, that will teach you his process, his approach to photography. These new photographers that we're talking about, the ones that are on Instagram who have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers, and their work is incredible, they're in the thick of it. Yes, their work is outstanding. It's incredibly creative. In fact, a lot of them, I hate them a little bit. Come on, look, they're so creative. But the problem of it is, is they're, they're in it. They're in the thick of it right now, which means they suck at communicating it. I'm, I'm not being mean to them. I'm being honest about the process. I just said a few minutes ago, I've been teaching about 10 years now. If you would have met me 20 years ago and asked me to teach something, I probably might have agreed to teach it somewhat reluctantly because I didn't think that's something I'd ever want to do, but I would have been horrible at it. Absolutely horrible. Because I was so busy and so in the moment with my work, I was in that sweet zone where much of my decision-making process on a day-to-day -day basis with my camera was instinctive. So I would have been one of those teachers that basically stands in front of a group of people and says, yeah, you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to do this and you have to do that and do this and that and this and that and this and that. And what good does that do you as a student? Unless you're the kind of student, if a teacher tells you to go jump off a bridge, you're going to run to the bridge and jump. It doesn't do you any good. It's the hows and the whys, right? So one of the things that I teach younger photographers who are interested in getting into education in that today is, look, if you want to be a good educator, you've got to meet your students where they are in the learning curve. Help them solve their problems. Don't give them these 50,000 foot view, accomplish this, help them solve their problems, and then you'll be a great educator. So that's why you study the masters. So Eggleston has actually had an incredible career. And by the way, I'll go ahead and share the link to him. It is already uh, in the description below the video. But if you take a look at his work, uh, if you've been following along with these photographers that I've been talking about and, and sharing information on. Um, so here's the page actually on my website that's got his bio, uh, some of his quotes, some videos about him, um, books that he did, also some cool little uh, trivia bits about him that you can read about and then his full bio there. But if you go and you um, look at his work, he's got an incredible body of work. Uh, it tends to be very kind of minimalist and almost, I, I look at it as almost kind of an Americana type vibe. Um, some of his color work for me is very reminiscent of a photographer that you've heard me talk about many times before, Peter Turner. 
uh, very simple, um, monochromatic, duotone type color schemes that are bright and bold and kind of in your face. Um, and what was really cool for me, here's the personal piece, because I told you I'm going to share two photographers with you tonight, Eggleston and his quote. Um, and I want to go back to the quote in a minute also, because I know I just sidetracked a little there. But um, there was a young lady who I had the pleasure of meeting a few years ago. She was originally here from uh, the Allentown area in Pennsylvania, where I am. And uh, I actually met her because she had reached out about doing some modeling. And um, she has appeared in a few of my images that you folks have seen on my website and on my social media. But she now lives in California. And since the time that I met her, so I can't take any credit for this. I'm just sharing the story. Uh, but I want to share some of her work with you. And I'm hoping that a lot of you uh, who have Instagram will consider following her. Um, since the time that I worked with her, with her in front of my camera, she has developed an interest in photography and she has become a prolific film shooter. And what struck me while I was doing my research for the photo quotes and my page on my website about William Eggleston and looking at his work is her work is a kind of modern variation of Eggleston's. This is actually just one of her shots, which uh, is also very kind of reminiscent to me of some of the types of things that we would see from, you know, from Peter Turner along the way. But uh, I'm going to share the link to her um, uh, Instagram profile for you to take a look at. She goes by the handle of Phony Hawk. Okay. Um, everyday mundane settings photographed in visually striking ways. And that is what's so strong about her work. Very similar to the way Eggleston approaches things. Um, I think in part because of her film uses, film usage, you'll find her colors tend to be a little bit more muted than what Eggleston or Peter Turner, who I mentioned, but uh, just very simplistic elements. There's a minimalism, but also an, an a incredible attention to detail in the work. Regardless of the type of photography that you're into, please understand this. There's a lot to be learned from this. So I don't care if you shoot models. I don't care if you shoot portraits. I don't care if you shoot sports. It doesn't really matter. The idea of looking to simplify your images so the subject pretty much smacks you in the face. There's tremendous value to that. So uh, again, in addition to Eggleston, I'm going to share her profile. I would encourage you because she is young. She's in her 20s. So we've got a very big generational divide between these two photographers, but incredible talent along with incredible similarities. And for me, that's kind of what I find fascinating because Eggleston obviously has been at it for a long time. She is fairly new to the process and exploring and building out her style. And it's actually been, for me personally, it's been a lot of fun to watch, especially since, since I know her, but I can't take any credit for what she's done. No, not at all. So I, I don't want to make it sound like that even in the slightest. Okay. Um, her work is, is outstanding, but to go back to uh, Eggleston's quote, in fact, let me just hit on that really quick here. The reason why I really wanted to share this quote today was to make sure that you understand that doom scrolling on Instagram and looking at, you know, every contemporary photographer's photography and every YouTuber's photography is honestly worthless. If, if they're not really sharing the hows and the whys. I, and I don't mean the YouTubers that are like, yep, this video is sponsored by Aperture Lighting and I use this cool Aperture Light. No, they're not sharing squat with you. They're pimping a light and you're suckering for every ounce of it. Okay, I'm talking about people that are really sharing the process. Because knowing what kind of light they used or where they put that light is useless to you. Absolutely useless. So, food for thought. Let's... uh. 
move on here. I do have, uh, I got to back up because I know I skipped something. Oh, actually, yes. One other quick thing here. Let me switch a page over. And uh, well, you know what? I want to dive in tonight's topic first. Let's let's get that out of the way because this is going to be probably a bit of a head scratcher for some people. So um, let's get into this and All right, so this is a big one for me tonight. Um, I have been accused recently um, of going on these crusades. In other words, um, really kind of getting focused, pun intended, on these topics that I sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, feel are important to the photography world um, and important changes that need to occur. Uh, but the problem of it is in these crusades, I'm kind of swimming upstream. I'm going, to, I'm going against the flow, right? So I want to present something to you tonight about exposure and the fact that most of you are approaching exposure in all the wrong ways. Now, I know for some of you right out of the box, that's kind of irritating because you're thinking, well, my pictures turn out just fine and I'm doing okay. So what the hell is he talking about? Do me a favor. Have a cup of coffee, take a sip of soda, better yet, have some alcohol, whatever, but just breathe for a few minutes and open your mind and listen to what I have to say. But let me save you some time. If you're not going to hear me all the way through, so it's going to take me about 15 or 20 minutes to get through this. If you're not going to hear me all the way through, why don't you go do something else with your camera right now? Because it'll benefit you more. You, you've got to have an open mind to get something from this. But if you do, if you give me the 15 or 20 minutes and, and you actually process this with an open mind, I am confident I can change the game for you and make your photography better with this piece of information. Now, also one more clarifier. This is why we had the poll at the top of the chat for you that are folks that are here live uh, about is your primary camera digital mirrorless DSLR film or smartphone uh, and 68% currently of the people that are in attendance uh, as we're here live are mirrorless shooters. So unfortunately for you DSLR shooters, there's a couple things I have to tell you first. Number one, it's okay that you're shooting DSLR. It's okay. Don't listen to what anybody tells you. I mean, you will eventually come over to the dark side. Okay, that's just part of the process. That's where photography is going. But for now, you do it when you're ready. And I understand for a lot of you, especially uh, potentially if you're older and photography is a hobby, you probably have you know a good bit of money invested in glass, etc. And you know, making a change over to mirrorless is going to be really like very very expensive. Okay, so. Seriously, no pressure for me. This conversation, though, is really geared towards dear, uh, yeah, excuse me, mirrorless camera shooters because some of it is useful for you DSLR folks, but not all of it. I'll try and separate that out at the end when I get through it, right? So for the 68 or 69% of you now that are uh, digital mirrorless shooters, let's clarify a couple of things, right? First of all, one of the things that comes up every time photographers talk about exposure, it comes up about it online, in articles, it comes up about it in camera clubs across the world, and photography presentations like there's no tomorrow, is this thing called, you ready? You've all heard of it, the exposure triangle. So here's the thing. I need all of you to understand this, first and foremost. If you are a firm believer in the exposure triangle, if you feel that that is the best way to learn exposure, you've been bamboozled horribly. For those of you who have the thought process and, and don't laugh at anybody here because for the last six months, every presentation I have done, I have asked this question of the groups that I'm presenting to. And I've wound up with the same results. 
I'll go in and I'll say, hey, you know, how many of you know about the exposure triangle? Okay. Uh, how many of you use the exposure triangle? How many of you learned about the exposure triangle very early in your photography life? And then how many of you have been shooting for more than, let's say, 30 years? And you'd be amazed how many people that have been shooting for more than 30 years will hold their hand up and say, oh, I've been using the exposure triangle forever. So allow me to give you definitive proof. I defy anyone to find information to the contrary, because you can't. So first of all, the exposure triangle did not exist until 2005. 2005? Most of you think that you were using it in the 70s and the 80s. Now, what tipped me off to this when I started teaching 10 years ago, people would talk about the exposure triangle all the time. And, and honestly, I kind of found myself feeling like some kind of fraud because like, I could figure out what it was. And I had good mentors but I didn't remember ever learning about the exposure triangle because I hadn't. It just showed up somewhere along the way. So I want to share with you the actual origin of the exposure triangle. And it's a two-part, well, actually a three-part, excuse me, evolution, right? So part one, here's the catalyst for the exposure triangle. In his 1990 book called Understanding exposure. Let me move that over there so you can see it and get the reflection off it. Brian Peterson, great photographer, very accomplished. In the book and on the back cover of the book, I'm going to read this, states, uh, where is it right here? Okay. Um, he explains how to successfully combine aperture, shutter speed, and film the elements that compose what Peterson refers to as, quote, the photographic triangle. This is the first reference you will find in history, in print. And remember, the internet wasn't around then, okay? This is pre-internet. This is the first reference you will find in print anywhere of a triangle in reference to exposure. He go, it, the book goes on to say, he defines each element of the triangle and shows, here's the keywords for me, how it relates to the other two. Relates. That's a great word. So it was just an offhanded reference. You know, it's three things. So you could think of it like a triangle. And by the way, there is no triangle anywhere in this book. There's no picture of an exposure triangle. So he did not design the exposure triangle. Now, fast forward, the next imprint, okay, uh, <laughs> IMDA Brown, that's great that the military was using the internet, but photographers weren't. So what information did that statement contribute to this conversation? Come on. When you're typing and you're running your mouth, you're not listening, which means you're not learning. So why are you here? Okay. I'm the teacher, shut up or go someplace else. I'm trying to provide you with some useful information. Now, 2005, 15 years later, this guy, Jim Miyatki, publishes this book, Better Photo Guide to Digital Photography. Now, before I go any further and tell you about this book, Jim Miyatki, you can actually Google him. He was a web developer in 2005. He had started this community, betterphoto.com. Some of you may have even been members, right? Uh, great community. It's actually a very good book. But in the book, Miyaki on page 60 states, in his classic book, Understanding Exposure, Brian Peterson refers to the triangular relationship relationship between aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, which he calls the photographic triangle, okay? And then he goes on to say, so let's take a look at how this exposure triangle works. There is the very first time the phrase exposure triangle 
was delivered publicly. Right there. Now, even crazier yet, it was almost a year later before the first, oh, and by the way, no triangle. It was almost a year later before the first image of a triangle with aperture shutter speed ISO showed up on the internet. In Miyake's book, he also talks about how ISO changes the sensitivity of your camera's sensor. Eh, wrong. Misinformation right out of the box. Because even in 2005, that is not how digital sensors worked. So he drank the juice when the camera manufacturers stuck with ISO so that photographers wouldn't be afraid and spread misinformation because he was misinformed. He had not done enough research into how ISO on a digital camera actually worked. So exposure triangle at best is a memorization technique. But here's what you need to understand, folks. Actually, there's the key word, understand. Memorization happens on one side of your brain. Understanding happens on the other. The two do not cross paths. Just because you can memorize something doesn't mean you understand it. That's it. So, it's time to get rid of the exposure triangle, period. It is not a part of the conversation, okay? Now that being said, digital cameras, digital mirrorless cameras, we need to change the way that we look at exposure and how we approach exposure. So one of the first things that I want to point out is what exactly is correct exposure, right? That, that, so that's the first challenge that so many photographers get stuck on. What is correct exposure? So let me tell you what correct exposure is not. Correct exposure is not what your camera says is correct. Ever. Ever. It could be the same as what your camera says is correct, but your camera is never the arbiter of correct. Because your camera can't interpret what your creative vision is. Your camera can see what you see, but it can't interpret your creative vision. So, I mean, just as a simple example, right? And, and this is uh, an actual set of photographs. The, the overlay is just for illustration purposes, right? But look at the settings, 2.8, 250th, 1, 000, or ISO 1000, and the camera says this is proper exposure. And yes, this particular shot, the camera was set up on center-weighted exposure. This was a mirrorless camera. The reason why the boy's face is overexposed, his forehead especially, is the top of his forehead blown out. It, it's not there, right? Is because his face is dramatically brighter than the grass in the background. But the grass in the background makes up over 95% of the scene. So that's what the camera is averaging out and trying to manage. And it's a great exposure for the grass and the leaves, but not his face. So just mindlessly following what the camera says frequently will not get you correct exposure. Because in this case, correct exposure is actually almost a stop under what the camera says at f4, same shutter speed, same ISO. But now we have detail in all of his face. That's correct exposure. So it's also worth noting while we're talking about what is correct exposure, correct exposure is not a bell curved histogram. That's the biggest bunch of crap ever. All a bell curved histogram is is an evenly lit scene. And that's it. This particular image, when it's properly exposed, gives you a bell curve histogram, right? But it's the exposure that achieves the intended effect. Ooh, there's a spelling error. I left out an N in the word attended. That's really bad. But here's the thing, okay? And, and here's where I want you to start to, to understand a couple of things. So this quote, correct exposure to juggling act Literally, it is a juggling act every time between reality, imagination, and physics. So you need a solid command of the physics. And all that is, I know physics freaks people out. It used to freak me out too. Photography physics 
on a practical sense, us using it every day is not hard, right? The physics part is, you know, shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and the relationships between them, and how you use that to create the image that's in your mind's eye, in your imagination, right? But going back to the histogram just for a second, an image like this, which this is a proper exposure. It's one of those backlit images that I showed you last week. There's the histogram, shoved all the way to the right-hand side. So if I was determined to get a bell curve histogram out of this, I wouldn't be able to take this picture because there's no way to get a bell curved histogram out of this. So I don't care what your subject matter is. I don't care if your subject matter is uh, landscapes, architecture, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're doing creative work, you can't allow yourself to be held hostage to the histogram. Because even in this case, where the histogram is pushed all the way to the right-hand side, you'll notice I circled the only areas of the image that are completely blown out, that are totally white. That's not bad at all. That is completely acceptable and within boundaries, which by the way, that means that even that white background is not a pure 255, 255, 255 white in RGB. But look at that histogram. This is why I don't pay attention to histograms. And this is why as a digital camera shooter, there's no reason for you to pay attention to a histogram. Unless, and by the way, uh, let's be clear, because I know some idiot is going to, you know, jump all over this in the comments later, okay? Well, you know, I photograph artwork for a living, and I needed to be a perfect replica. Yes, there's going to be exceptions to the rule, scientific exceptions like that, where if you get hired to go photograph the Mona Lisa, you darn well better have an accurate reproduction, right? overwhelmingly, most of you do not have those kinds of needs. So holding yourself hostage to something like that is not helping your photography, but not helping your photography at all. The relationship between shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, it, it's relationships. It's how do they all fit together, right? So every time you go to take a picture, when it comes to setting your exposure, it's like creating a puzzle or completing a puzzle excuse me, right? I mean, that's really what you're working on. So I'm going to share a quote with you next. And this is the quote that I hope all of you, in fact, I will add this quote to the description after um, the show. I apologize. I should have put this quote in the description, but this is a quote that I hope all of you will remember. And I promise you, if you force yourself to memorize this quote and even kind of recite it to yourself for a little while until you really get comfortable with it, it's going to change your photography insanely. Here it is. Choose your shutter speed with purpose, your aperture with feeling, and then adjust the brightness with ISO. Now, let me break this down for you. And again, I'm going to ask you with an open mind to follow along because the next sentence I'm about to say will be pushback for some of you because you've been taught differently. But I'm going to tell you the most important setting of the three exposure settings, shutter speed, aperture, ISO, the most important one. And actually, that's a bad way to put it. It's most important that you start with, for every picture that you're ever going to take, every picture, you should start with shutter speed. Now, I know a lot of you will tell me right back, ah, I always start with aperture because I like shallow depth of field and I like to shoot wide open. Relax. You can still shoot wide open. It's not a problem. But you need to start with shutter speed for several reasons. Shutter speed, as it says in the quote, is a purpose-driven setting. So what does that mean? Shutter speed is going to control your ability to hold the camera steady and not introduce camera motion. Shutter speed is going to control the camera's ability to stop any motion that's in front of it, whether that be just a person moving casually, whether that be a person running, whether it be sports, race cars, doesn't matter what it is, but the shutter speed is going to determine whether or not the image will be sharp based on movement. So that's a utility purpose, right? That's a, that's a, a purpose-driven setting, period. 
Are there ways that you can use shutter speed creatively? Absolutely. But for all intents and purposes, the majority of your photography, shutter speed is a purpose-driven setting. So you pick that first. Then you choose your aperture with feeling. And why do I say feeling? Because think about it. Aperture has a major impact on the emotional elements in your shot. Most of you that like to shoot f1.8 or f1.4 or 0.95, you love the feeling of that super shallow depth of field and those creamy bokeh backgrounds. Cool. If that's your thing, that's cool. But it's creating an emotional response. That's why you love it. Let's say that you need to be able to get four rows deep of people in. Well, let's face it. The picture would be kind of weird if you only got the first row deep and the other three. So yes, aperture is also serving a purpose, but it's creating and managing the emotional feelings within a shot. So shutter speed for purpose, aperture for feeling, and then you're going to use your ISO to simply adjust the brightness to make it lighter or darker. Now, this is the one that we need to have a little bit more conversation about. And I'm going to give you a solution because I know the panic that's going to set in for a lot of you, and it's going to be all about noise. So again, take a breath, follow along for a minute, okay? First of all, if you were a digital photographer in the early 2000s and even in the 2010s and that, you probably still have PTSD and nightmares over digital noise. It was horrible. I remember on my Nikon D1, all of 2.5 megapixels, one stop boost in ISO, there was already, you know, image quality fall off. And then you get to two and three stops and the images were just completely unusable because the noise was not only huge, but it was multicolored. It was, it was horrible, right? So understand that your cameras only have one ISO. Let's be clear. They only have one ISO. And just to make it so we don't get into the stupid, you know, word games, they only have one level of sensitivity. Let's leave ISO out for a second. They only have one level of sensitivity, period. Every ISO setting that you have, aside from that base level, hence the base ISO, it is a software interpretation of that ISO. The software that we have in cameras today is incredible, but you still reach a point with every camera and every camera brand where for most people, the noise will be too great. The good news is it's not one or two stops difference. For some people, and depending on your camera, it could be four stops, five stops. It could be six or seven or eight stops before you're introducing noise that you find objectionable. So the first thing I'm telling all of you mirrorless shooters, and by the way, you DSLR shooters should do this piece. You're not going to be able to use the final piece of this that I'm going to give you, but you should do this piece, is I would encourage all of you with your cameras to do an ISO tolerance test. Don't bother Googling it. You're not going to find it. This is a Joe Edelman thing. But you'll thank me for it. You will. Some of you already think you know the number, but I'm going to encourage you, if you've never actually done this exercise, It'll take you 20 minutes, 30 minutes tops. Do the exercise. You'll thank me. Put your camera on a tripod or set it on a table. You can do it um, inside, outside. It'll probably be easier to do it inside. Start at your base ISO and get an exposure on your viewfinder or in your EVF with your digital camera, DSLR shooters, you can, you can do this with the LCD. In other words, play it back, okay? But get a proper exposure for that scene at your base ISO. Then, don't move the camera. And by the way, you only need one frame, one frame. Once you've got the exposure dialed in, get rid of all the junk frames, take one frame of that. Then the next shot, you're going to raise your ISO to the next ISO. So if your base ISO is 100, then you're going to go to 200. You don't have to do the third stop ISOs. Just keep doubling the number. So go from 100 to 200 to 400 to uh, 800 to 1600 and so on. 
each time you adjust the ISO, you've got to adjust either the shutter speed or aperture to keep the exposure level the same. In other words, the brightness of the picture the same. But you're going to go all the way up to your camera's maximum ISO, which for some of you is like crazy high. And then, by the way, you're going to finish up by going down to the lower ISO. So if your camera's a base ISO of 100 and it goes down to 50 or it goes down to 25, do shots at those lower ISOs. One frame at each ISO, adjusting shutter speed or aperture to make up for the lightness difference so that when you load all those pictures into your computer and you open them up in Lightroom or you open up in Bridge, they're all going to look exactly the same until you blow them up, right? Then what you're going to do is you're going to enlarge each of them to 100%, not 200, not 300, 100%. And you're going to sit in an average viewing distance, not like inches from the screen, at an average viewing distance. And you're going to go up the line until you get to the image where it's like, mm, it's getting kind of noisy. And then you're going to look one more and that's going to be like, ah, you see, that's horrible. Go back to the one before. That is your ISO tolerance. And by the way, I can tell you already, the lower ISOs, the 50 to 25 and those, you're not going to have any problems with those. But do the test so you see for yourself. But you want to find that maximum ISO where, yeah, there's noise, but it's very tolerable. And by the way, we're not talking about what you can do with denoise or AI. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about just pure quality straight out of the camera. That number, that maximum ISO number, that is your ISO tolerance. You need to know that number about your camera. If you have different model cameras or different brand cameras, they will have different numbers. Test them all. But you need to know your ISO tolerance. Now, that's important because in your camera, every one of your cameras, you have the ability to set a maximum ISO. That applies to when you have the camera set for auto ISO. So whatever your ISO tolerance is, you're going to go in and you're going to set that as your maximum ISO. That way, your camera will never exceed that ISO without alerting you. That's what you want. Okay? Now, remember, since you have an EVF, you're seeing the finished exposure when you're looking through the viewfinder. Right. We're not talking about studio work, by the way. We're talking about anything that's not in the studio where you're actually using your camera to adjust exposure and things like that. When, when you're in a studio, you should be using your lights to adjust exposure. Right In the studio, I decide. I want my exposure to be this. That's my exposure. I make my lights meet the camera. That's in the studio. Everything else, the camera is responding to what's there. So now... The easiest way to shoot with a DSLR, or excuse me, with a, a digital mirrorless camera is auto ISO. With a digital mirrorless camera, there is no reason to shoot aperture priority or shutter priority. None. Zero. Think about it. Think about what I've just told you. Shutter speed and aperture are the two important settings. You don't let the camera deal with those. The least important of the three settings is ISO because it's nothing more than gain. It's like a volume control on your stereo. Lighter, darker, lighter, darker, that's it. So how do I make that work? So as an example, this is the Sony a7 IV, okay? On the back of the camera, let me make sure that I can get this to show up here. The back corner, this dial right here where my, my thumb's going over, that is my exposure compensation dial. The greatest part of pretty much every camera that's on the market today is you can customize elements of it. Uh, some people use their back wheel that they, they customize that for exposure compensation. But I have this set for exposure compensation. So when I go to shoot something, I pick my shutter speed with purpose and I dial that in. I pick my aperture with feeling with me in my mind. How does that translate aperture with feeling? That means like today as an example, uh, I took a picture in a classroom for my wife today. It was a group picture of her students. They were about four rows deep. I needed to make sure that I had everybody in focus. I was shooting with a 28 millimeter lens. F um, 7.1 got me everyone in focus. So that determined my aperture. And then I let the camera decide the ISO. But now, just like that picture of my grandson with the green grass behind him, 
when we're dealing with auto, if you just set auto and ignore it, your camera's going to mess up from time to time. Cameras are not perfect. So you still have to pay attention. But when I'm holding my camera, my left thumb, or my right thumb, excuse me, is on this exposure compensation dial. So if the picture's a little dark, I'm going one way. If the picture's a little light, I'm going the other way. And I'm adjusting it so that the exposure is perfect to my eye. Done. Super simple. FN89 has a question here. Do you happen to have the ISO tolerance in writing or posted? I'd like to try out what my schedule allows for. Uh, not today, but stay tuned. By the time I come back next week, that article should be out there and, and ready to go. I actually have a lot of content coming out about this exposure conversation. And, and look, here's a simple thing that you all need to know. So I gave you a little bit of history about why you should stop, stop with all this exposure triangle. Crap. Understand that in the 1980s, I believe the gentleman's name was Steve Sasan, worked for Eastman Kodak. He was involved with the early digital cameras. So these were the digital backs that Kodak was making uh, in cohorts with Nikon. Remember the original, you know, pro-level digital cameras were like Nikon bodies with Kodak digital backs on them, right? They were, you know, kind of Frankenstein cameras. Um, starting all the way back then, the engineers were smart enough to realize, because they were all into photography themselves, they were smart enough to realize that a lot of photographers, and I mean a lot, I don't mean just a few, I mean the majority, were going to be really scared to death of digital technology. So when they got to the point where this digital technology was ready to become consumerly, consumer available, hence Nikon D1, they knew that if they started changing all the names of everything, and if they changed the way that we figured out exposure, that people would freak out. They knew literally that it would be like a sky is falling moment. Kind of like this thing called AI. And oh my God, it's ruining photography. Because photographers, we never get dramatic. Never. <laughs> right? So they were very smart, but they made a very really smart decision. Okay, we're going to design the cameras around those settings. Well, the good part is shutter speed and aperture, there were physics involved there. Aperture being the easiest one because it's optics, right? And shutter speed, it was really easy to take that same concept and, and bring it forward. Done. Boom. But then we got to ISO. They didn't have technology and they weren't planning technology to have sensors have variable ISOs. That was the software. It was interpreting it. But it made sense to carry forward ISO. So here we are. You know, that was 1980s. So even if we go from 2000, the year 2000, when the Nikon D1 came out, we are 23 years down the road. We are now using cameras where you see the finished picture as you press the button when we're talking about exposure. Right? You're seeing it before, during, and after you go click. But we still teach photography triangles. We teach about ISO sensitivity. In fact, look, I don't make this stuff up, gang. I mean, even today, this is how bad it is. Here. Whoops. Wrong one. This was on F-stoppers today. And, and I'm not just picking at F-stoppers. Just, this just happened to show up on my feed today. I'm like, oh, my God. Here we go. Right? How to expose your images like a pro. And this article is the biggest piece of BS ever. But it's the same BS. So in all deference to whoever this person is and to S-stoppers, it's the same BS. But I want to scroll down here. And, you know, some of the advice is functional advice. But it's the same stuff that's being been taught forever. But we get down here to ISO. This is the property that controls the sens sensitivity of the sensor to light. No, it doesn't. It goes on to say in the next sentence, lower ISO values mean the sensor is less sensitive to light. No, it's not. Right? We're still teaching it like it was film. That's the problem. Your cameras have advanced way beyond where we used to be, but photographers are afraid of change. Our industry is afraid of change. And it makes no sense, right? So again, I know for a lot of you, change is stressful. You know what you know, all that kind of stuff. I know this is kind of really out 
in left field. You're going to hear me talking a lot more about this because I, I do want to get a couple questions in here. But I promise you, and I would love anybody because I've, I've said this every time I've talked about this in the last two years. I've been talking about it a lot with camera clubs in the last two years because for me, if you follow me long enough, you know that it's really important for me to find concise ways to be able to explain things so people understand it better. I've been working on really being able to communicate this concept for well over two years. I did an insane amount of research on the, the, the exposure triangle, an insane amount of research. Um, it's something that we need to change. It is another one of my crusades. We, we need to change it. I'm not wrong. The rest of the industry just hasn't figured out I'm right yet. But I will gladly have a conversation with anyone who takes exception to this concept and thinks that I'm wrong or thinks that I'm promoting bad information. Nobody's been able to take me up on that yet. Nobody. And, and I'll do it privately. It doesn't have to be a public thing. I don't, I'm not looking to embarrass anybody because look, if I'm missing something, I want to know about it. There's always exceptions. There's always going to be specific needs, but for most photography, everything I share with you tonight, it applies. So more to come, I promise. Um, FN89, you asked about, uh, do I have an article on that? There is an article coming on all of this and the exposure triangle with all the, the sourcing and citations and everything. Um, it's really, really, really important that we move on because we're, we're just using a lot of old, outdated information and a lot of old, outdated ways to teach photographers how to do photography. And that's not helping. It, it's just not helping. Right? So, that being said, uh, let's see here. I did see one question go by, I thought. Uh, sorry. Uh, cool. So, I see a, a bunch of you talking about uh, making a switch over to mirrorless. Yeah, I mean, I joked before about, you know, moving over to the dark side. Obviously, most companies are stopping their R&D on, um, you know, DSLRs. So, eventually, yes, DSLRs are going to phase out. But, look. For those of you that have DSLRs, it doesn't mean you should be panicking right now or being scared or anything. No. Um, you know, it, depending on where you're at in, in the, the whole curve of photography in your life and in your career, um, you know, you may get to a point where you have to change. Um, but there's nothing that says like, hey, you know, I've got a DSLR crap. I've got to go and, you know, buy a new camera now. No, not absolutely not. Not at all. Okay. Uh, well, actually, well, this is good. So we don't actually have uh, a whole bunch of questions here. I had one question from a member of my Tog Knowledge community. Uh, and Mike, if you're here tonight, we will talk about it tomorrow night um, during our, our weekly um, community meetup because I, I wanted to, you know, really make sure that again, this, uh, there is one other quick question um, that I missed last week. So, um, and I apologize. I don't remember who the person was that, um, posted this, but they had a question, um, about slick pick. I had talked about slick pick a few weeks back and my bad. I mentioned that after the show, I would add the link for slick pick and the discount, um, to the description of the video. I overlooked doing that. So they did come back and put a post in. Uh, so I just, for those of you that are here, um, I'm going to go ahead and share this. It's a 25% off for life discount. Uh, I, I don't make any money on this. Okay. Um, but um, I do have a, a website hosted at Slickpick. In fact, if you go to their website, you'll be able to link to my sample website. Uh, but what I actually use Slickpick for is for their galleries. Uh, now, um, if you are a photographer that's looking to be able to do like digital downloads and have people buy prints and that kind of stuff, Slick Pick is not your answer. You want to be looking at like Smug Mug or Zenfolio or Pixie Set for those kinds of things. Um, but you've heard me talk before that uh, every year uh, when I'm shooting um, baseball for my my grandson, um, I shoot every one of his games and I share I shoot all of the kids on the team and I share the pictures for free for all the families and allow them to download full res, you know, files. And, uh, I even give them a printing release that they can print out if they want to take it to a lab and get it printed, they can do all that kind of stuff. 
Slick Pick is awesome for that, for creating galleries that I can then share the link with people and they're able to go and download them, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Michael Kramer, the Talk Knowledge Meetup is, that's at Eastern time. So it'd be 5.30 p.m. tomorrow Eastern time, right? Okay. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know what we're talking about, uh, my Talk Knowledge community, which I've told you about many, many times before, um, you'll find a link in the description below the video. There is a seven day free trial. It's only, it's less than $7 a month to join. Less than $7. Okay. Um, and the best part is you have direct access to me to ask me questions, to get advice anytime you need it. But you also have access to 300 other photographers that are all around the world. Uh, who are a very supportive community. Um, there are a few other YouTube educators there, but they're Joe Edelman approved educators. Uh, people like Rob Trek, uh, who's known for his work with uh, Olympus cameras and that uh, outstanding. He's a, a very, very active participant in the community uh, and he's a great mentor, great educator, uh, really puts a lot of effort into it. So, you know, they're not in their pitching gear. Uh, they're in there helping people improve their uh, photography. But yeah, every week um, we do a uh, video. Most weeks, every so often, my travel schedule gets in the way of that. But And we alternate them. So uh, one week, uh, they're at 1230 in the afternoon, my time here on the East Coast, so the people in Europe uh, are able to attend in the evening for them. And then the next week, it's at 530 p.m. Eastern time uh, So for people in the U.S., that kind of stuff. So. Um, you should check it out. It's a great community, great learning opportunities, tremendous support. Okay. All right. So that's all I got for you next week. Uh, I will have a little bit more in the exposure stuff, uh, and some other things coming up. Um, next week, that's all I have for this week. Sorry. I said that backwards, but we are out of time. I want to thank you for watching. Uh, I do again, hope you found some value in everything that I talked about tonight. Um, if you can't make it to the show live next week, if you have questions, um, by all means, leave your question in the comment below the video. I'll answer it next week. Uh, I was really serious when I said I'll talk to anybody about this topic. If, if you really have concerns about what I'm talking about with this exposure stuff, go to my website, fill out the contact form, and I will send you back a link, and we will schedule a quick Zoom call together, and, and I will uh, absolutely have a conversation with you. Um, that being said, if you haven't done a thumbs up yet, please help other photographers find out about the show. Even if you thought everything I said tonight sucked, go ahead, hit a thumbs down. It actually still helps me. Bottom line is, I want people to find out about the show. But remember, gang, you don't get back the days that you waste. So please, go pick up that camera and shoot something. Because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang.